and the outdated tactics get left behind. The next time we stop, marketers look around when your brain keeps going down. It's the Jim and Ann Show. Today, we have a special day because we're here with Dwayne Forrester, who is the VP of Industry Insights for Yext, and he's been there for over five years. In his past work, he also worked for Microsoft and Bing for more than nine years, where he was a senior product marketing manager with Bing, and he helped to run the Webmaster Tools program and the SEO program at MSN, and he's the author of a couple books on how to make money with your blog and how to turn clicks into customers, and he was the search personality of the year in 2014. He's a speaker at SMX, PubCon, SEO Oktoberfest, and a whole bunch of other conferences, how do you think search engines might measure the user experience? Oh, well, um, let me take a stab at this since one of the teams that I was on at Bing was the UX measurement team. So, hmm, I have some ideas here, Jim. <laughs> um, <laughs> so turns out, you know, that thing, that experience that you have in life, turns out it can be useful at times. Um, okay, so there's a few different things here. I think... If you do not believe that every single action that can happen um, is being measured, like if, if you don't think that that's happening and you don't think that that measurement and output is being applied to future state scenarios, you're really missing the point of search today. And what I mean is this, every single action that happens on or around Google, and that includes, I have Google apps on my phone. I look up a business on my phone. Do I go into the business or not? Or I look up a business on my phone, but I walk into the business next to it, but I don't look up the one that I or don't go into the one that I actually looked up. That data is available to Google. So I believe that all of this is open to data mining internally. So these machine learning systems are capable of understanding us on an unconscious level. We walk around through our lives and we do our things and we predominantly go to this coffee shop and we predominantly go to this, you know, pet groomer and we predominantly go to this gas station and so on. All of those are signals that help Google understand me as an individual and then layers. Kind of, of an example of that and, as well would be Google Discover. You know, they're yes. looking at everywhere you're going and what you're exactly. doing. And here's exactly, your... exactly. So. So I think that when it comes down to it, like I know we were tracking at a pixel level. We were making pixel by pixel changes in SERP pages and watching the result of that and seeing if you added two pixels here, did it increase readability? Did it increase click-through rates? Did it decrease? What did it do? And you're running those experiments on an hour. Did it make us some more money? Did more people it, click on part, ads? That is a part <laughs> of the entire thing. Like uh, from my experience, I was on the organic side but the paid side has that similar data input, right? And so like all of that gets factored in and there's no doubt that it's like comparison shopping, right? Do you, like, do you think running things like, you know, another thing kind of tied in with this and with usability is, I don't know the percent of sites that do A-B testing, but it's less than 1%, yeah, you know? Uh, you know, talk about, you know, another missed opportunity in SEO, you know, have you ever tested two different pages to see which one is uh, having the action that you desire from the user? It, it, is, it is tragic how little A-B testing happens. <laughs> and, and I can't stress enough for people how important it is to have a clear understanding of where you stand and where you should step next. I am a firm believer that the concept of dwell time matters to a search engine. And listen, I know Google has gone on record and they say it's not a metric, it doesn't affect ranking, blah, blah, blah. But it's got to affect something because when somebody clicks on a result, goes to a web page, the engine can tell how long it takes to read that content. Like knowing how long it takes the average person to consume a piece of content is not a mystery. The engines obviously and very clearly can understand that metric. Any of us can. We can just look it up. And so if you know the person landed on the page and they didn't consume the content because they were there a half a second and they came back and then they clicked on a different result, there was something about that result 
that did not resonate with the searcher. So I, I, I love this talk. So now you we're know. kind of talking about the short click versus long stick. I get right. Like, and, uh, short click versus long click and the pogo sticking. Yeah. So yeah. it's got to have an impact. And, and I, I don't agree. mean like a direct impact, right? Like it's not binary one to one, but there's again, a trend, right? Like if you think at the scale that the engines operate on, so you want to do AB testing on your website, right? And you're a mid-sized business. It might take you a month or five weeks to gather enough data on your AB test to feel confident that you can call the ball on A or B to move forward. It's a significant investment. You've got to be like, you can't be making the call based on five clicks. So you got to sit there and wait until it becomes a thousand instances and you've got a clear split one over the other. And, and that could take weeks. Yeah, it's not like that with Google and Bing. Like, like we'd run experience uh, experiments at Bing and it would be, some experience experiments would be over in a matter of an hour or two. And you had so much data then it took weeks to analyze the data. And, wow. but like gathering that information is just like that. And so, so it's rarely binary that you have this, you know, Oh, I clicked on it. And then I went back and then it doesn't show up for me again, because there is a personalization that happens every time. Let's, like, let us let's talk let's let's define let's go into that a little bit deeper and almost define the mm -hmm. the pogo sticking and how google might measure a user experience so correct me if i'm wrong on um on this but let's say you know someone searches for i don't know a dark coffee and let's say they go to google and they click on result number one and they're on that page for three seconds and they instantly go back to that google search and click mm -hmm. on number two. Mm -hmm. To me, that sends bad signal. Hey, they obviously didn't trust it or like it. They quickly left, came back, clicked on number two. Mm -hmm. now, let's say they go to number two, and maybe they're on the page a long time. You know, they're on right. that page for three minutes. They go to several other pages on the site, but then they go back, 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 and go back to that Google search and click yep. on number three. It yep. might tell Google that for whatever search they ran, they still couldn't find what they were looking for. Even though they were there for a long time and they went to multiple pages, they still went back to that search. And let's say they go to number three and they click on it. They're there for 30 seconds, but then they go off to Facebook or Twitter. It kind of tells Google they must have found what they were looking for at number three. Or number two may have answered their question triggered another question and rather than redoing the query the consumer came back and kept exploring the SERPs to see if the other results might also answer their next question so so like and the reason i say that is but that I, I think advocate. part of it there's a lot of, there's always the exceptions but i think that if over time everyone right. or they see all right you know there's been a if you see that XML. pattern repeat over and over again the because number like there's there, like there's the some people you're... that complain about like, you know, time on the page where there's always the exception. If you're a weather mm -hmm. site, they might find it and leave. But right. you know, Google may also be like every competitor has the same signal and yeah. they don't seem so to then, go back and click on the next one. Of, yeah. Three seconds is the norm. And if that's the norm for your peer group, then having a three second time on page is fine. If it was a 0.5 second time on page, you'd stand out as a negative, basically. And by the same extension, if it were a two minute time on that average against three minutes or three seconds, then Google might be looking at it going, I feel like maybe the person abandoned that. Yeah. Like, because that seems like an awful lot of time to spend where everybody else spent three seconds, you spent two minutes. Yeah. That doesn't feel like an engaged session. Okay. And to be fair, that presumes that Google is seeing you engaged on that page generally speaking they're not generally speaking the only thing they're seeing is the absence of you on their page so that three seconds and two minutes yeah. could yeah. like encompass a whole bunch of crap you know like i don't know maybe you had to go check on your toddler like yeah. there's your two minutes you were there for three seconds but it turned out it was actually two minutes yeah. and when you came back you went oh yeah click back and then google's so looking at it saying what do i do with that data 
So the the pogo sticking and user experience in Google search results might be a great way to measure uh, the user experience or the user satisfaction with a particular phrase in a page. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on this next point. I think Bing used to or may still use, and I, I might be wrong, click-through rate in the SERPs as part of a ranking factor, whereas Google says they don't use click-through rates in the SERPs for a ranking factor. Am I correct on that? So that's my understanding. And I know at Bing at one point that had been said. I don't know if it's still the case today, but I will say this, okay? I am a firm believer, Jim, in the nuance of answers. <laughs> There's as much said <laughs> in an answer that is not stated as there is that is stated. So when someone it's the talking, direct versus an indirect, the yeah, other right. some things have a direct effect, some have an right. effect, but it, it's kind of an indirect. Effect. So look, <laughs> I can understand because it could be dangerous and expensive, and I'll explain both of those if click-through rate was a direct ranking impact on a SERP, okay? So it could be dangerous because Jim lets Jimbot go nuts clicking on this link. And Google looks at that and goes, holy crap, that's popular, you know? And it skews the results. And then that page is always ranking high because the click-through rate is massive and off it goes. It's expensive because someone at Google looks at that data and goes, that doesn't look right. And that means a human has to spend time looking through the data, writing code and programs to figure out if this is real or fake, only to then find out it's fake, to then go back and say, hey, spam team, how do we fix this? Okay, we need to tweak the algorithm. Okay, we're doing an update because people like Jimbot are out there abusing click rate as a direct signal. So completely understand why you wouldn't just say, hey, let's put click-through rate as a direct signal and use it reliably. However, um, do you ever like walk in somewhere like a shopping mall or a movie theater or somewhere where there's a crowd of people and then you see within that crowd, there is a kind of density happening, right? Everybody is over at the book signing where the celebrity is outside the bookstore, Okay. Google's very curious about that, as you would be as a human. You would walk along and go, oh, what's going on over there? And you'd go over to find out. Google is very curious about that as well. So when there's a lot of activity on a website, they are interested in this because they want to know, why is this so popular? Is this something we should know about? Should we be amplifying it? Should we be showing it to more people? Is this the best answer for a query? Is there a time frame attached to this? Is this a new trend? All of those factors are coming in. So I think in calculating all of that, click-through rate plays a role in that. So it's not a direct factor, but it's a part of a calculation that then gives you an output that then is put into another equation that then generates an output and cascading all the way through the series of algorithms to eventually be a signal that machine learning looks at and goes, ah, okay, piece of data. Now I can make a decision. So... And this is why, again, before I moved physical locations, astute viewers will notice, <laughs> uh, those ripples on the pond that were behind me, the, again, ripples, like we're not talking somebody dropped a rock in the pond here, right? We're talking somebody took a handful of sand and threw it in the air. And some of those grains of sand hit the water. And now there's an infinite number of ripples on this, on this pond. It's Almost like you're looking at yourself and you're seeing beautiful, clear Jim Boykin reflected back to you in the calm pond water. And then Dwayne comes through the handful of sand and he puts it out there. And you still know it's Jim, but it's more like Picasso Jim at this point, right? It's slightly impressionist version of Jim's face in the pond. And yet we still know it's Jim. We still understand that it's him. And so I think that's kind of how things like click rate, when we're told they're not a direct part of it, I believe the statement, they are not a direct part of it. But I also believe behind that statement is, well, how many pieces are a direct part? Well, technically very few, because in order to get to that point, everything is broken down to the fifth decimal place behind the zero. 
So when you start looking at it at that level, there's a lot that has to happen to get back up to one. You know, and it's like uh-huh. that's that's kind of I think how these things are being done. So so if you want to look at dwell time, yeah, probably not a direct thing because that's tough, right? I mean, and honestly, like how are you measuring that on this device? Like, what does that even mean? Because I could have my browser open for months. And what does Google do with that signal? Like, let I me let me quick it. ask about bounce rate because there's a lot yeah. of a lot of people think. Uh, to me, to me, bounce rate isn't an accurate measurement because they don't tell you if it's the good bounce or the bad bounce. Like right, right, long exactly. Yeah, whether there's right. satisfaction or not makes a big difference in what a bounce rate actually means. Come to a weather website, looking for the temperature. It takes you five seconds. You see what the temperature is. You bounce back to the search results. Technically bounce, but you're satisfied. So everybody's happy. Like, I'm not freaking out about that. So really, that. so really the question is, is almost look at the phrases that people are using to reach your pages and asking yourself, are you serving those users? It's about engagement. So when the person came in, did I do a good enough job to keep them with me? Or did they leave because I failed to do a good enough job? And so whatever your bounce rate is, you shouldn't be looking at Google to tell you whether it's good or bad. They've got their own opinion on that. You should be measuring your own success with your bounce rate. Meaning, yes, I want to see it go down. But what I want to see is the increase in my useful content, the engagement on that increasing. And you should be able to map these two things. My bounce rate went down because more useful content captured people. And the way you get that, the way you understand that's working is because they go from consuming content to in your funnel. They're taking the action you want them to take. They're Mm -hmm. buying something. They're signing up for a newsletter. Whatever it is, they're taking that action. And this is a perpetual bee in my bonnet with the industry is too many times we have SEOs throwing the next step over the fence. My job is to get traffic on the website. I'm done. And no way, no sir, no ma'am, no how. Like you are in it for the long haul. If you bring me garbage traffic, I am going to drive over you with my steamroller. That is not why you're here. Like you, you are a part of this team. You bring me good traffic. That's what I'm after. Garbage traffic, I can get that all day long. It's cheap as chips. That's not a problem. Quality traffic, on the other hand, that right there, that's the value. And if it's quality traffic and you can convert them, dude, you got a good business right there. I have a quick question. Yes. So yeah. I have just recently discovered the Bing Clarity. Have you ever tried the tool? They do heat maps, recordings uh, of people using the site. One metric that I was really intrigued by, they are measuring how fast people click the back button. Yeah. I've never seen that done by any other tool. Right. So do you think that could be a signal we should be keeping an eye on? I think it's a signal you should be aware of. I don't know that I'd be making decisions on it right now. And here's why. Um, so that type of tool that you're describing, like I had access to that internally and I would see that data and that output. I love that it's publicly available now. I think that's fantastic. Um, it goes a long way to helping explain some of the squishy stories that SEOs have to tell and helping kind of like get an empirical look at something. Uh, incredibly powerful for that. However, it is still a snapshot in time because you won't have the ability to see as much data as maybe you would want to. And that strictly comes down to the sheer amount of data that they have to store on the back end. That's a hard cost to the company. And it's not unlimited. It's easy to think, oh, it's Bing. They are part of Microsoft, which is part of Azure, which has cloud storage. If Bing wants more cloud storage from Azure, they pay for it. So like all tools like this, there are limitations on them, right? Google will have a similar scenario. and so I think that it's fantastic. I, like I say, I'm not too worried about making my decisions based on that, but I definitely want to know that that's available to me. It's a very clear indication of look, what are people clicking on and what's engaging with them. From there, the SEO in me is looking at, 
okay, Google rewrote my title tag and I'm using that title tag now on my website and I'm putting it out there and it's showing up in Bing and I see that the people are constantly hitting back on this. Maybe I need to look at my title tag again or is my description not engaging enough or is it misleading in some way that I'm unaware of where the person scans it, they get an impression, they land and then they come back again because for whatever reason that impression didn't match what they were expecting, you know? it kind of forces you to open up your thinking a bit more. And for that- Maybe even, really I was thinking, that. yeah, I was thinking maybe like if there are a particular page that gets too many back button, exactly. back actions, you exactly. know, so in comparison with other yes. pages, I wish we could see how people push that button landing on our competitors, right? Page. So, so, <laughs> so that's the piece we're not, uh, we're not- that Simple. would be epic. I agree. <laughs> uh, here's what I might do with it. If you can, create a report <clears throat> where you capture the URL, you put the URLs in line based on, um, they're in the report based on their volume of backlick activity. But then in the next column, you put a dollar figure next to them and you resort the entire thing by the dollar impact to your business. Now you have a list of URLs that are seeing the back activity based on how important they are to your revenue. So now you can prioritize the list of what you need to go investigate and work on fixing. Like that, it's invaluable for being able to do exercises like that, right? That's huge, I think. Yeah, it might be as easy as like making that heading more visible for people to yeah, see immediately exactly. that exactly. they are there landing might be a on the right thing. misalignment or, you know, you... You thought you were being clever when you wrote the opening paragraph and you kind of took a person on a journey and it turns out they didn't want to go on a journey they just straight to the point, you know? So it's like, well, this isn't exactly Pulitzer Prize winning writing, but turns out that doesn't matter. Let me just tell you, this is the price. This is the value. This is where you use it. Now do you want it? And it's, it doesn't need to be more complex than that. And in some cases, that's, that will, that's what you'll find out. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Absolutely. Jim, you want to do